explored how people develop morally, and he came to a remarkable conclusion. While there appears to be very specific progressive stages of moral development as one grows from a small child to an adult, people generally only reach a certain stage and stop there. To make matters a bit more complicated, some people behave in ways that seem to indicate that in certain areas of their lives, like their work, they operate at one stage of moral development, while in another area of their lives, for instance as a parent, they appear to be at a different moral stage. Lawrence Kohlberg's moral development framework was first established way back in 1958 and was subsequently refined by him right up until 1971. We still use this framework today as it has been demonstrated to be a powerful tool in describing how we identify, articulate, and apply moral values in shaping our personal character and in guiding the choices we make and of course the actions that flow from these choices. Let's take a quick look at it. The Kohlberg framework consists of three main levels, each of which has various distinct stages. For now, let's just focus on the main levels. The first level is what Kohlberg called the pre-conventional level. At this level, the child's moral universe is centered on herself. The world exists to nurture and protect her, respond to her needs, and stimulate and amuse her. No one else really matters. She learns after a while that there are some boundaries about what she can expect of others, and later still she understands that others have some expectations of her as well. She becomes responsive to cultural rules that tell her what is, it is to be good and bad, right or wrong, cute or naughty, and she quickly learns that these moral qualities will be judged either on the basis of the consequences of her action, does she get punished or rewarded, or on the basis of the physical power of those who make the rules and judgments. The child has no innate ability to understand why something is good or bad, but she understands the power of others to make that determination, and she knows that if she behaves in certain good ways, then desirable outcomes, a candy treat perhaps, will follow. Next comes the conventional level. At this level, the person knows that he must live up to certain comprehensive role models, the nice boy. He knows that to meet the expectations of his family, group, or nation, it's important to conform as closely as possible to the qualities demonstrated in that idealized role model, regardless of any perceived negative consequences or unpleasant side effects. He feels strong pressure to conform to society's expectations and to respect the clear structures of the established social order, but not just to conform. He's also expected to be loyal to it, actively maintaining, supporting, and justifying the order and identifying with the persons or groups involved in it. At the conventional level, the prevailing moral values are set by the leadership of the community or group and by its long-standing traditions. There's significant disapproval or even downright rejection of anyone who has the audacity to think that he can decide his own moral values for himself or even question the appropriateness of the values that are implicit in the role that he is being told to conform to. Finally, we get to Kohlberg's third level, the post-conventional level, sometimes called the autonomous or principled level. At this level, the individual decides not to simply accept the package of moral values that society hands to her. She goes on a different path and makes a clear effort on her own, first to reflect on and then finally to define for herself those moral values and principles that make the most sense to her. She will be resisted in doing this. It challenges the status quo and throws into question the validity and relevance of moral values that others have seldom if ever questioned. To succeed at the post-conventional level isn't easy. She will need to have a well-developed ability to carry out sophisticated critical thinking so that she can challenge the very strong moral arguments that will be thrown at her by those at the conventional level who feel the need to protect the authority of the group's values. The individual's own identification with the conventions and moral values of the group will need to be renegotiated if this is to be done, sometimes by making a place within the group for this eccentric or radical person, but in many cases such persons are rejected by the group and they become very isolated. Nevertheless, without the influence of post-conventional level people, the group's values would become stagnant and gradually ineffectual. 
these critical thinkers help to shape what in time becomes convention. Several important observations arise from considering Kohlberg's framework. To start with, people are made aware that the moral values that they hold and that they define their identity by initially come through a process of adopting a package of values from their parents, teachers, other authority figures, including the media. There is a very strong emphasis on accepting the whole package and not asking too many questions. These packages of moral values are usually quite different for women than for men. Women are brought up, or as some will argue, are more naturally inclined to give moral priority to caring, nurturing relationships and to more readily express compassion, empathy, or mercy. Men are brought up, or as some will also argue, are more naturally inclined to place moral priority on more abstract values such as justice, retribution, rights, and duties. Someone once summarized this by saying that those men who want meaning in their lives are always looking for a heroic cause that they would willingly die for, while women who are similarly seeking a meaningful life will look for a cause that they feel strongly called to live for. The self-examined life is one in which we consciously define our own moral values. In so doing, we may decide to accept or reject some or all of the group's values but we reject the package at considerable risk of being rejected by the group. Still, the path of self-examination, which is also called critical thinking, is an important part of moral competence. We become much more able to see where values come into conflict, and we can use this skill to see through situations where inconsistency in moral values ought to be called out. We become critical thinkers. Critical thinkers are morally competent people. They are able to see the moral gray areas, avoid many moral dilemmas, and not fall victim to the temptations to ignore the moral and ethical dimensions altogether, or to apply simplistic moral rules to every situation. Good ethical performance requires critical thinking and moral competence, starting with moral awareness at the individual level, and then at the organizational level. With the right leadership, Institutions and governments, too, can be morally competent and can benefit from the critical thinking and moral competence of all of their stakeholders, but only if this is approached in a conscious, structured way. Good ethical performance ultimately depends on finding a workable path between both views of human nature, inspiring those who want to be and to do good, while giving them training to sharpen their moral competence while at the same time providing a workable complementary framework of incentives and disincentives that responds to human natural self-interest. Making local governments into ethical governments is a big job. We need to start by getting morality and ethics onto the good governance agenda, raise awareness, and develop the tools that we need to bring integrity into the pattern of our lives and our work. We need to begin that process with the PPI. Thank you.